That might be a good word for all of us there, that concept of calluses. I think you're all familiar with it. The Bible does warn us that we can develop a calloused heart, and we've got to be careful of that. Calluses develop little by little, especially when it's subtle. Uh, if you're aggressively swinging a hammer all day and you've never swung a hammer, you'll be very mindful of it. And usually you'll be sore and you won't touch that hammer again for several days. But if you've always swung a hammer, you're going to have some very serious calluses on your hands. Uh, when I used to work with drillers in the drilling industry, um, <laughs> there was a guy named John. He was a really, he was a good driller. We were doing geotechnical drilling. And just to explain this, uh, you have a, a geotechnical rig drops a three and a half, a three and a quarter inch hollow stem auger into the ground and it spins. It has a cat head and a clutch and all that. But as it's spinning, um, to make production, you, you have to break the thing. Uh, by break, I mean slow it down. You pull a lever, you break it, and you can't do anything on the rig till it stops moving. Then you can pull the pin out, raise it, drop another five foot auger stem on it or whatever you're doing. So sometimes to save time, you want to stop this thing spinning faster. It spins fast, the brake is not going well. And so John had been a driller 25, 30 years when I met him. This is early 2000s. And because the brakes weren't always fast enough, he would use the palm of his hand to brake it, to slow act as a brake pad. And I've never seen anybody do it. And he would just reach over there with that auger spinning and he would just hold the, the cat head till it stopped spinning. And because of that, the callus on the palm of his hand was probably no exaggeration, half inch thick. It looked like um, almost like an elephant's hand or something. And I, I, he actually, the only reason I noticed is because he was complaining to me that his wife didn't like holding hands anymore. And I said, why not? And he said, well, look at these things. <laughs> and I said, have you tried lotion? He said, son. <laughs> I said, have you tried not using your hand? And he said, we got to make production and it doesn't stop fast enough. But that's not something you develop overnight. You don't develop a half inch callus on the palm of your hand, stopping augers overnight. And you and I don't develop calluses on our heart overnight. We start by justifying things we know we shouldn't. And then in charismatic, spirit-filled circles, we'll say, well, the Lord hadn't spoken to me about this. We always blame the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't, I don't have a check about this. This is where we say, let the word be the more sure word of prophecy. Let the Bible be a more sure word of prophecy. Quit waiting for some conviction on the inside. If it violates other people's conscience, the Bible says we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If your behavior makes Christians feel uncomfortable, where's your check? If your behavior makes people feel backslidden or they're questioning what you're doing because their conscience is more tender than you, there's a, there's a problem. And so we have to, we would do well to judge ourselves in these arenas and ask the Lord to show us maybe where our conscience has started to get a little calloused. Are you watching things you used to reject? And television's very slick. They just slowly start making it. I've even heard myself saying it. Well, there's only a little bit of murder. There's only, there's only a little bit of language. Well, there was a time when if it had anything, I'd just turn the thing off. And so slowly but surely, you're callousing your heart and life to worldliness. And of course, we know with the, the whole uh, LGBTQ thing, that's becoming mainstream. So it isn't a TV show if there isn't at least four or five LGBTQ people with their struggles. And now transgenderism is a common character. And honestly, even anymore, you can't tell uh, who is and isn't. In fact, I saw a picture on an article that I thought, well, that's a pretty girl, not a girl, not a girl. So then I wonder, what does that say about me? What's wrong with me? That's a pretty girl. I mean, I can, I can acknowledge, I can recognize beauty. Turns out not a girl at all. Just a lot of surgery. So, <laughs> just stream the sitcoms from the 80s. You should be okay. <laughs> Television 40 years ago, <laughs> maybe that's the message here. <laughs> Watch what you're watching. Figure out where you're callousing your heart and you're permitting things you would not have permitted five years ago. Figure out where you're permitting things you used to judge other people for doing. Maybe judge that. What are you permitting now that you used to be critical of other people? Amen. All right, that aside, this is our last service on the sacraments. We 
kind of hit and miss sporadically since maybe last fall. We were teaching on the seven sacraments of what is called or are called the high churches. Um, this is our last one. I have purposely done this one last because it is called confirmation, the, the, the sacrament of confirmation, simply because it's a little bit difficult to find an analogous example in Protestantism, Pentecostalism. The other sacraments are easy to see why they are sacraments. We'll review those real quick because some of you haven't been here for those teachings. I am in the process of building this into a pod school teaching because I think the rest of the body of Christ would benefit, especially Pentecostal circles, and we, we need to understand something about it. Now, mind you that when we talk about this, the foundations for this teaching are over 1,500 years old. And one of the dangerous things the modern church is doing is we're forgetting where we come from, trying to be relevant for the current era. And when you forget where you come from, trying to be relevant for the current era, you really have nothing to offer the current era. And I, I'm mindful as we were worshiping, I, I thought I'm going to do something that would make Brother Hagen and Pastor Vaughn roll over in their graves. I'm going to read directly from the Catholic Catechism tonight. But I thought, you know what? Pentecostals did not evangelize India or Japan. 700 years ago. It was Catholics and Jesuits. It was, we met Catholic Indians yesterday from India and uh, their names were very Christian. And I, 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 I said, are you guys Hindu? And they said, oh, no, 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 we're, we're Christian. I thought, and I told them, well, based on your names, I figured you were probably Christian. And I thought you're Christians today because Jesuit and Catholic ministries, missionaries, sailed around the Horn of Africa in the 14th century to bring the gospel to you. Pentecostals didn't do that. Word of faith didn't do that. Now, do Jesuits have issues? Yes. Do Catholics have issues? Yes. Do Pentecostals? Do word of faith? <laughs> Does the body of Christ need God's help? Yes. So anyway... We've been teaching on this. We've probably done 12 or 13 lessons on this. So let's just review. What's a sacrament? A sacrament comes from the Latin sacramentus, which is the equivalent of the Greek mysterion. So a sacrament is something that is a New Testament mystery. Mysteries, the term mysterion is used 27 times in the New Testament. We have Christ in us, the hope of glory. There is the mystery that is Christ coming to live within us, the born again experience. That was a mystery. We talk about in 1 Corinthians 14, when we pray in tongues, we speak out mysteries. So that's not one that requires a sacrament, but it is still a New Testament mystery. So then a sacrament, and this dates back all the way to the early church fathers. You're talking third and fourth century, Cyprian, and some of those other church fathers that helped establish doctrine out of North Africa and Greece and, and the Levant. Mysteries, or excuse me, sacraments are rituals that reflect some of the New Testament mysteries. Sacraments are rituals. We practice some of these, even as Pentecostals. I was raised Southern Baptist. We practice some of these, but we didn't dare call them sacraments, at least not that I remember. But as we've covered these seven, we recognize, yeah, we, we grew up with some of these. And then others, we realize we do that even as Pentecostals, but we don't acknowledge it as a sacrament. And I think over the course of the last few months, you realized we probably should treat these with more respect and honor. And by doing so, we could probably expect the Holy Spirit to show up in greater manifestation. I think we would all have to agree as Pentecostals, Charismatics, Word of Faith, all of that came about by the Holy Ghost falling in the Jesus movement and the Charismatic movement, trying to get the church out of legalism. But in trying to get out of legalism, we threw away all the laws. And that made us lawless. So now you have issues with Charismatic and, and, and Pentecostalism is just buck wild and weird without any structure. And we threw the baby out with the bathwater and we were left with nothing except an empty bathtub. So in talking about these sacraments, we're recognizing these are rituals that reflect some of the New Testament mysteries and then something the Catholics teach. And I have to give this disclaimer. Obviously, I'm not a Catholic. I am not up to speed with Catholic culture like I am Pentecostal culture. 
I know Pentecostalism, word of faith really well. I know all, not all, but I am very comfortable and fluent in all the nuances of charismaticdom from the Bethel movement and the Jesus culture movement and IHOP and then word of faith and then church of God, church of God, prophecy, church of God in Christ, assemblies of God, etc. I'm comfortable. I know how all these different believe. There's a lot of nuances in Pentecostalism. There is in Catholicism as well, and I'm not fluent in all that. So just because we're going to read something out of the catechism doesn't mean they understand it or practice it. And so a Catholic might say, well, that's not how we do it. And I would say, okay, I can't speak to that. I'm just reading out of your catechism, which just means teachings. And it's actually very watertight. All the footnotes are scripture, except for a few other footnotes that quote some of their other documents. But I've told you, if you were to read this, you would probably wholeheartedly agree with 95% of it. And I've never met any denomination that has a system of teaching this thorough. Not Southern Baptist, not Word of Faith. Nobody I've ever been around, except for the high churches, systemizes their doctrine and codifies it for everybody to study together. That also explains why there's so many different branches of Pentecostalism, Word of Faith. Our problem is when our fathers die out, we go wild. Their popes die out and get replaced, and they stick with the same catechism. We actually asked Dr. Barclay a couple years ago, why is the charismatic movement so crazy? Why are we so goofy? Why are we all over the place? He said, because we don't have a pope. He was not recognizing the systems that are in place. Now, the problem with any system is if you miss the heart of it, you become legalistic. And that brings us back full circle. Now we need to move the Holy Ghost to get us out of legalism, but we don't reject systems. So all that to being said, something the Catholics teach that I learned from the catechism is that a sacrament is a ritual that reflects or symbolizes a spiritual truth. It is a ritual that makes power available. And that's the thing I think we taught a few months ago that blew everybody's mind. A sacrament is a ritual that symbolizes a mystery in Christ but the ritual itself makes power available. And as we studied the other six sacraments, we realized, holy Toledo, that is true. The one that opened it up for me was the sacrament of marriage. I could see it. What a ritual, a sacrament. It reflects Christ in the church. And until the ordained minister says, I now pronounce you husband and wife, not an Elvis impersonator, not the justice of the peace, not somebody with the marriage license off of, you know, matrimony.org, but somebody ordained of God by the power vested in me. I now pronounce you husband and wife. Even a lot of our marriage vows we use around it says something powerful goes into effect. We lay hands on them and the grace of God comes upon them to make them a husband now and a wife. There's a power made available through the ritual that is a marriage ceremony. It is a ceremony, and yet the mystery is Christ in the church. So that was, that's the one that I said, I could see it. I could see it. I could see it. So let's run through these seven sacraments real quick. Baptism, I'm going to go in the order of the high church. This, these are the order of the sacraments as listed by the Catholics and all the other high churches, the Episcopals, etc. Baptism, that is a ritual, a rite that makes power available. We've had some of those testimonies in our own church services People go down, they come up weeping, sobbing. The power of God hits them. Uh, Rick will tell you many times we put clean water in there. Two people get baptized and it's filthy. And those people weren't dirty getting in the bathtub. And we can't explain why the baptismal font was nasty. Other times that we just recently baptized seven, eight, nine people and the water was clean. And other times we've baptized just three or four and you can't explain it. That, why is that water so dirty? with just two people dipping in the water for less than a minute each. It's not like they get down in there and agitate like the washing machine. And they're, they, everybody comes. You're here when they, we baptize them. They come with just a very formal, modest little outfit, black t-shirt, black shorts. There's nothing to make the water dirty, but there are times when that water is disgusting. That's a supernatural thing. If you remember the Brownsville Revival, they had videos all the time of people getting water baptized, coming out, demons coming out of them, them flopping like fish, shaking uncontrollably under the power of God, a ritual. And it's nothing in the water. It's city tap water. So baptism, it, it, uh, it cleanses us for the remission of sins. 
Tonight we're going to talk about confirmation, so we'll skip that. Communion, we know that there is power made available through that ritual because Corinthians says if you don't do it worthily, you will eat and drink to yourself condemnation, judgment, weakness, sickness, premature death. So you better believe there's power in those communion elements. We don't believe like the Catholics that uh, uh, transubstantiation where the bread becomes the literal flesh of Christ and the juice becomes the literal blood, and yet they base it on John chapter 6. And they will fight you for it. They'll, they'll ask you, don't you believe in miracles? Yes. Don't you believe the words of Jesus? Yes. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Okay. And they will walk you through it. A plus B equals C. Right. A plus B equals C. And you're like, I don't see C. You believe A? Yes. You believe B? Yes. Do you believe equals C? I do not. And so you can go round and round all day long and say, agree to disagree. That's communion penance. We talked about that. Penance just means the confession of sins, or they call it the sacrament of reconciliation. This is where they involve the confessional booth. And we don't need a confessional booth. Jesus Christ is our high priest. But at the same time, James does say you ought to confess your faults one to another. There is a place for confession. There is a place where you got to get things off your chest. you got to repent. I don't stand in the office of priest, but there is the concept of the ministry of all Christians as priests. The Bible tells us we're a holy priesthood. So we still confess sin. The one that maybe is a harder concept is the sacrament of penance, which is, yes, you've confessed your sin, but there's something more to do. Now, you bucket that. I bucket that at first glance, because what more is there to do? But the Catholics teach, well, there is a mess to clean up. And though Jesus does forgive you, you still got to go clean some things up. And, and then when I was studying out of the Catholic catechism on penance, I thought, my goodness, I've done this in my office a thousand times. Walk somebody through something horrific and tragic, and we realize, yes, we're forgiven, but we got to do something else to make sure we fix this. And it's not works. We've already received forgiveness. The index card with five scriptures that you pray to make sure this doesn't happen again, that's penance. Going and restoring that which you have stolen or taken or repairing something or taking someone out to lunch, that can be a penance. In the Catholic faith, they, the, the priest prescribes that. It might be Hail Mary's. It's going to be other things. It's going to be community works, outreach. It's anything you do that realize, I've got to rectify the mess I made. And sometimes your heart just says, what, Lord, please forgive me. And we do see that throughout the Bible. Then that brings us to one week charismatic love. That was the sacrament of anointing the sick. They call that extreme unction or the terminus end of anointing. We covered that extreme unction just means what you do before people die. But there is this concept in the Catholic Church, and we recognize it, that you anoint the sick with oil. That is a prime example of a ritual that makes power available. If any of you are sick, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord will raise them up. So it's a prime example because unless the ritual of anointing with oil takes place, there's no power made available. Even when we do it here at the altar, we call people down or folks say, Pastor, can you pray for me this morning? Sure, I'll get the elders. We'll anoint you with oil. We can all stand there. There's the person who needs prayer. They're going in for surgery or they've had a diagnosis. And we have all the elders around them and we have the anointing oil here. As long as we stand there, though the will of God is healing and we have a command to do it, until we do it, there's no power. This is a prime example of what a sacrament is. It's a ritual that makes power available. It's a ritual that actualizes what it symbolizes. So we give all the elders anointing oil, and we all touch them and rub it on their forehead, and the power of God goes into effect. And for me, because I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times, to me it's the craziest thing in the world. I feel nothing until I touch them, and then all of a sudden, there it is. There's the tangible anointing of God, and it goes into their body. And but as long as we stood there, it's potential energy. It isn't happening until we obey and fulfill the ritual. Same as here in a few weeks when we do Ben and Jessica's wedding, we can have them standing right here in front of me. Until I make the pronunciation, there ain't going to be no honeymoon. I may just stand there and see how uncomfortable we can all be. And we'll start driving up a, uh, an auction, five bucks, 10 bucks, 25 bucks, 50 bucks. The quicker you give me money, the sooner we can wrap up this wedding and we can move on to the reception and then you can move on to the honeymoon. <laughs> 
But until we pronounce it, the power of God does not go into effect. They are still brother and sister in Christ. But we have to have that ritual that manifests the symbolism of, of the biblical mystery, a, a groom and his bride. Ordination, we believe in that, and that's a wonderful thing. Until we lay hands on those people, the power of God does not anoint them for that office. Lots of examples of that in the New Testament. Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he made them apostles. And then they laid hands on Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 13 and said, Separate unto me Paul and Silas for the work wherein to have called them. Until we lay hands on people and ordain them into the ministry, they are not ordained. And people who put themselves in the ministry greatly lack that ordination and that anointing. And it's as simple as someone who's over you in the Lord laying a hand on you, anointing with oil or not even with oil, but just pronouncing and laying hands. And even the denominations have ordination services, and most of them still practice the laying on of hands. What to me is wild is apart from the charismatics, the most hand laying on people in the kingdom are Catholics. They lay hands for everything. They do it for confirmation, which we're going to cover tonight. We get ordination, of course, and we covered marriage. So those are your seven sacraments of the church, baptism, confirmation, communion, penance, also called the, uh, the sacrament of reconciliation, anointing the sick, ordination, and marriage. Seven, seven sacraments of the New Testament church. And again, these, these began to be established probably fourth and fifth century. They were worked out and uh, we would do well to pay attention to them. I am working on a pod school lessons, set of lessons, so this can be a lot more consolidated. Uh, all right, so now confirmation. The catechism teaches that the sacraments of baptism, communion, which is also what they call Eucharist. Eucharist just means Thanksgiving. We call it communion. Baptism, communion, and confirmation, they constitute the sacraments of Christian initiation. So these are three very important uh, sacraments to the high churches. By high, we just mean smells and bells, very ornate. Uh, high churches are churches that recognize a living priesthood. That's kind of how that's defined. We are not considered a high church because we don't recognize a priesthood. We have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, but we don't have a so-called priesthood. But these three are, uh, are a trifecta that are very critical to the high churches, baptism, communion, confirmation. The reason the high churches believe in infant baptism is taken from the book of Acts. You and I don't believe in infant baptism. We call it believer's baptism, which means you have to believe before you can be baptized. But they take it from the demonstration in the book of Acts when entire households were baptized. Their logic says babies would have been included in that. That's why they baptize infants. They also mix that a little bit with what we call Church of Christ doctrine, which is Baptism saves. Whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So though they look at the same scriptures, they come to a different conclusion. We disagree. We don't think baptism saves. We don't think infants should be baptized. All right, just to be clear on that. Communion, of course, is very important. It's the premier sacrament to the high church because it keeps you saved because you're partaking of Christ his flesh and his blood. And then confirmation is important because this confirms, that's why they call it confirmation, this confirms what they call baptismal or salvation grace. Now, this is one that's harder to find an analogy for us or analogous relationship simply because we don't have a ceremony for it. In the high churches, confirmation is a very big coming of age ceremony. And it can become very legalistic, and the heart of it's completely missed. But the heart of it, even according to the Catholic catechism, is very, very biblical, and we believe in something very similar. These three together, baptism, communion, confirmation, these are the sacraments of Christian initiation. But for the Catholics and the high church, confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal, or what we would also call salvation grace. It both confirms, and again, I'm quoting out of the catechism, so please don't take all of what I'm saying as what we believe. I'm just trying to teach you the concept. For the Catholics, confirmation, the sacrament, the ritual of confirmation, confirms baptismal grace and strengthens the same. So consider the, the picture here. You have a child born into the Catholic church. They baptize that baby as soon as possible. We believe personally we should put a person through a class 
like the Ethiopian eunuch. He had faith, quick discipleship, maybe an hour or two of discipleship by, the Ethi uh, by Philip the evangelist. He has a class and he says, can I be baptized? And then Philip puts forth some criteria. Do you believe? I do. Well, then nothing forbids you. Let's get water baptized. God confirms it because he's disappears quick and he disappears and he appears in Azotus 30 miles away. But think about the Catholics. They recognize that a baby has no volition yet. A baby has no cognizance yet. So at, at a certain age called the age of discretion to the Catholics, this is when confirmation traditionally takes place. And we'll cover that here in a minute. But this confirmation confirms what they believe happened at infant baptism. It's them coming of age and confirming and reaffirming, I believe in Jesus. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. And honestly, reading it, it convicts me. I don't think we'll ever do a confirmation class necessarily, but I want us to listen very carefully as parents to what the Catholics have taught for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years because it's very biblical and we somehow miss it trying to run and dance and sing and shout. And because of that, we are, we're losing children to the world. I'm going to read some things out of the Catholic Catechism. I have some notes here. Confirmation, they say, confirms baptismal grace, and they take this from the book of Acts. So let me read this passage here. Their catechism is broken down in articles. It systematically lays out all they believe and why, and then they back it up with more scripture than you can shake a stick at. The fullness of the Spirit was, to, was not to remain uniquely the Messiah's, but was to be communicated to the whole Messianic people, as quoted in Luke, John, 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 and Acts. On several occasions, Christ promised this outpouring of the Spirit, a promise which he fulfilled first on Easter Sunday and then more strikingly at Pentecost. We affirm the same thing. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Don't go anywhere till you be endued with power from on high. Filled with the Holy Spirit, the apostles began to proclaim the mighty works of God, and Peter declared this outpouring of the Spirit to be the sign of the Messianic age. Those who believed in the apostolic preaching and were baptized, and here's where they make this distinction, they were baptized, they later received the Holy Spirit in their turn. So this is the pattern for the high church, baptism, then confirmation. So one of the key points for Catholic confirmation is this is when you receive the Holy Spirit. Just like the examples in the book of Acts, which they interpret one way, we interpret it totally different. They get water baptized, and then Peter says, or John says, or Paul says, have you received the Holy Spirit? We didn't know there was a Holy Spirit. Well, let's lay hands on you so you can get it. So this is confirming the baptism that you already had. God bless them. They're looking at scripture, coming to a different conclusion, but they stick by their guns and they're trying to symbolize it as best they can. From the time of the apostles in fulfillment of Christ's will, for, excuse me, from that time of the apostles, excuse me, from that time on, the apostles in fulfillment of Christ's will imparted to the newly baptized by the laying on of hands, the gift of the spirit that completes the grace of baptism. That is what confirmation is. It's the impartation of the Holy Spirit that completes the grace of baptism. And they come to that conclusion through their interpretation of Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, and Acts 19. The same passages we teach the baptism into the body of Christ, the baptism in the water, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. We're looking at the same events, interpreting it and practicing it totally different. So that, again, that's why I say I take, I'm not hardcore against the Catholics because they're studying the Bible. They've worked out their doctrine way more systematically than most charismatic movements today have. We just disagree with their conclusion. For this reason, in the letter to the Hebrews, the doctrine concerning baptism and the laying on of hands is listed among the first elements of Christian instruction. The imposition of hands is rightly recognized by the Catholic tradition as the origin of the sacrament of confirmation, which in a certain way perpetuates the grace of Pentecost in the church. They're saying by the laying on of hands, we keep imparting the Holy Ghost just like they did in the beginning. 
We agree with that. We just see a different end result. We get filled with fire and we speak with other tongues. They see it as a way to further establish your salvation through a renewed faith. Catholic confirmation, the, the, the sacrament itself involves the anointing with oil. And what the, what the um, I'll just quote this to you. It says, this anointing oil, also called chrism, highlights the name Christian, which means anointed ones. Now, I don't think I've ever heard any church teach that if we're going to call ourselves Christians, it should be because we are anointed ones. We, we know it from, they were first called Christians in Antioch because they were Christ-like, but to be a Christian means to be anointed. Why, why have we never seen that before? And this is why we also might be able to say, don't call yourself a Christian if you're not going to be anointed. To walk in the power of God, to be ready to lay hands on somebody in season out, to be able to witness to them, to pray for them. We ought to be full of God at any moment to confront sin or sickness or discouragement with the word in season. So many folks who call themselves Christians have zero anointing about their life. And therefore, maybe they should just call themselves churchgoers and Jesus followers, but not Christians. There's just so much to read here, and I don't want to give it, I don't want to bog you down with all of it. Confirmation involves the anointing with oil. Uh, anointing with oil has all the meanings uh, of the aforementioned article in sacramental life. The pre-baptismal anointing with the oil of the catechumens signifies cleansing and strengthening. The anointing of the sick expresses healing and comfort. The post-baptismal anointing with sacred chrism and confirmation and ordination is a sign of consecration. So confirmation, again, I'm trying to give you all their definitions so we understand this because I'm going to bog down here in a moment. We're just trying to move through the catechism. Confirmation is a consecration. And in essence, what it is is a rededication from a young person. I asked one of my Catholic friends uh, Thursday, I said, hey, sit down. Uh, I was over at the police station and I said, sit down, tell me in your words, what's confirmation mean to you? And he's like, oh, 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 you put me on the spot. I said, just tell me, you're, he's a devout Catholic. He loves God. We talk about God a lot and the things of God. He loves Jesus. He said, confirmation is when you grow up and you decide this God will be my God and this church will be my church and I'm going to walk with God for myself. I was like, that's good preaching. That's real good preaching. So I like, so the God of mom and dad isn't just the God of mom and dad. It's the God of you now. He said, yes, sir. I said, okay, so do you go through a class for that? He said, yes, sir. I said, how long? He said, usually about a school year. He said, and we're, he was he's from up north. He said, we went every Saturday and it was a couple of hours. I said, so what about sports and all that? No, no, we didn't have time for sports. Wow. And the modern church is like what? One 30 minute sermon a week for the seekers and the Catholics. He's a little bit older than me. The Catholics are putting their kids through three hours of discipleship to approach confirmation, to make sure you want to be a part of this. And, and we're chasing soccer balls and footballs all over God's green earth because you know, it's Saturday and this is what we do. And I'm not against those, but I, I, let's God, I feel like we've been outdone by the Catholics. We're chasing a, a ghoulie bump and a miracle, and they're dying on boats trying to take the gospel to Japan in the 14th century because they're so convinced of it. <laughs> the post-baptismal anointing with sacred chrism and confirmation is the sign of consecration. By confirmation, Christians share more completely in the mission of Jesus Christ and the fullness of the Holy Spirit with which they are filled so that their lives may give off the aroma of Jesus Christ. That's from the catechism. Confirmation, this is their quote, by confirmation, Christians share more completely in the mission of Jesus Christ and the fullness of the Holy Spirit with which they are filled so that their lives may give off the aroma of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 2.15. So again, it's a giant ceremony of dedication, willful acknowledgement, 
and dedication that this God is my God. I don't just come here, but I want to be a part of what Jesus is doing in the earth. I want the Holy Spirit to be a part of what he's doing, and I need that now, and I, I stand to do it. Jeff and Kimberly told me they just went to a family member's uh, catechism, on, I'm sorry, a confirmation on Good Friday, and she's an adult, but she was so excited, and actually that's when they typically do confirmation is on Passover week, Easter week, and just excited to say, this is my church. This is my God. I'm proud to be a Catholic. We, we, some of us aren't even proud to be in Grafted Word Church. <laughs> what church do you go to? I'm Grafted Word. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, what? In Grafted Word. Oh, that church. God bless the Catholics. Are you a Catholic? Yes. Ugh. Don't uh, me. Save my life. What about you and all your pedophiles? What about you and all your booze? They're not ashamed. Walk around on Ash Wednesday with ash on their forehead, telling everybody I'm a Christian. Yeah. Really, there's a lot to learn from other parts of the body of Christ. And we should do more to look at that. The anointing with oil in the ceremony stands as a mark. This is from the catechism, a mark of the Holy Spirit and the seal of his presence. Christ himself declared that he was marked with his father's seal. This is from the Catechism, Article 1296. Christians are also marked with this seal to quote, It is God who established us with you in Christ and hath commissioned us. He hath put his seal on us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This seal of the Holy Spirit marks our total belonging to Christ, our enrollment in his service forever, as, we, uh, as well as the promise of divine protection in the great eschatological trial. Confirmation is when they believe you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Again, totally different interpretation from what we would see or say, but the, what they're saying is these, these candidates for confirmation are saying, this is my God, lay hands on me, anoint me with oil because I'm making this my home. I'm making this God my God. Yeah, I was baptized maybe as a child, maybe as an infant, maybe last month, and I, but I understand what I'm doing and I want to be I'm committing myself. It's a public rededication service and an anointing service. And I don't know if, if charismatics just take it that seriously anymore. I know the seeker movement does not at all because we're just trying to collect. We, they are just trying to collect folks and have a big production. As a celebration, the candidates stand before the bishop who extends his hands over them, prays over them, then anoints them with oil on their forehead. And the catechism actually distinguishes in many places between the Eastern Church and the Western Church, the Western Church being the Latin, the Eastern Church being the Orthodox. And so there are some different ceremonies involved. So when you have a, an Orthodox, excuse me, a, a Latin, that is Roman Catholic, uh, confirmation service, the bishop, because it's the bishop who confirms them, he stands over them prays over them, then anoints every one of them individually in confirmation. And again, he's laying hands on them, anointing them with oil in response to their hearts saying, I want more of God. This is my God. This is my church. I want to be a part of it. So here's the prayer they pray when this service takes place. I like this prayer. It's quoting a couple of scriptures from the Bible. All powerful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by water and the Holy Spirit, you freed your sons and daughters from sin and gave them new life. Send your Holy Spirit upon these now to be their helper and guide. Give them the spirit of wisdom and understanding. That's Isaiah 11. The spirit of right judgment and courage. The spirit of knowledge and reverence. Fill them with the spirit of wonder and awe in your presence. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Pretty good prayer to pray over somebody. Now, the thing that fascinates me is what they call the age of discretion. And this is where we could bog down and maybe help parents prepare their children. What also staggers my mind is that it's a concept I've been teaching for about 10 years now. And it lines up with neuroscience, it lines up with sociology, it lines up with Jewish tradition. For centuries, Latin custom has indicated the age of discretion as the reference point for receiving confirmation. And for this reason, confirmation is sometimes called the sacrament of Christian maturity. And that indicates that at a certain age, 
children now become mature enough to walk with their own God. And the Catholics teach that's 12 to 14, which is exactly what the Jews teach. That's when their bar mitzvah or their bat mitzvah takes place. So I've taught that for years that you basically have to your kids roughly 13 years old to formatively disciple them into a walk with God. So I teach that, you guys have heard that for years, that from the time you have a child to their 13, that should be years of formative discipleship. After that, we go into a little bit of polishing discipleship, and then whatever you failed now becomes reparative discipleship. All of us in here are at some level of reparative discipleship because of our childhood or lack of childhood or lack of discipleship. Jewish tradition says at the age of 13, 12 or 12 if you're a girl, 13 if you're a boy, you become a son of the law. Bar mitzvah means son of the law. Bat mitzvah means daughter of the law. You go through that traditional ceremony, and at that point, you would be executed for your own sins if they were capital crimes. Can you imagine Jews executing a 13-year-old? But the Bible says, if you curse your mother, you're to be stoned. So there are executionable sins, capital crimes under the Torah, that once you became 13, 14, 15, you could be put to death if you violated. I don't propose it, but if we executed some teenagers in America, we'd have some straighter kids. <laughs> Every parent says, hey, I agree, because I've wanted to kill my kids once or twice this week. That's a joke. But uh, we do try some of our children as adults because their crime is so heinous. And we're actually seeing crimes in major cities where 11 and 12-year-olds are murdering people. I did just see a video surveillance of 11 and 12-year-olds running into a lady's garage and stabbing her to death. An 11-year-old boy and a 12-year-old boy run into a garage, rob a lady, kill her, and run leaving. I think you should execute those kids. They, it's not enough to just rob an older lady in her garage. you got to stab her to death. Those kids need to be put down. I don't think we should waste government money on the next 60 years of their life in prison. But that's my personal opinion. Neuroscience tells us that a child's personality is set by 13 or so. And that's where I really began to teach this when I read a book on neuroscience, that basically the personality is set, their habits are set, and from that point forward, it's going to take a lot of work to change anything. And that's why we began to emphasize 10 or so years ago, stop thinking you have till they're 18. Stop thinking you have till they're 18. You have until they're 13. My kids know it. Lydia's been reminding us, Daddy, you only have two more years. I said, that's right. What happens after that? I beat you harder. <laughs> and even my wife and I said, we have one more year. I'm like, yeah, we have really got to focus on this. If, if you're brought up thinking you have to your 18, you followed a government number, not a biblical or a neurological or sociological. We thought, really, maybe that was your jettison escape plan, 18. I just got to put up with them to the 18 that I can put them out. But discipleship, you have till you're 18. Neuroscience confirms that. Then sociological research, we taught this. I read this recently in a book uh, written by actually a Catholic, quoting a, a sociologist, that children, he said, children, it doesn't matter how you necessarily raise them. By the time they're 13 or 14, they will take on a peer group. That peer group will define who they are. And I didn't like that because it kind of ran crossways to the Jewish tradition, the neuros neuroscience tradition. But their example was you take an immigrant family. We, we take a Mexican family as an example because we can all understand that. You take a, a family from Oaxaca, Mexico. They come, they settle down in Cookville. They have babies. Their babies are raised Oaxacan, Mexican. Here in Cookville, they eat Oaxacan food. They eat Mexican food. They, they learn, learn Spanish with a Oaxacan accent. They eat tamales. They do whatever they do. They learn the traditions. And yet they also begin to come into the world of Cookville. They go to public school. So even though they have a lot of Hispanic friends and they're speaking Spanish, they're also learning English. And their English is always with an American accent. And they don't dress Oaxacan. They begin to dress with Transformer T-shirts, Transformer lunchbox, or Barbie or Dora the Explorer might be a little bit too on the nose for that. So maybe they go Barbie or something like Dora the Explorer. I beat her up when we were still in Oaxaca. Why do I care about that stupid kid? That chick's a sellout. <laughs> but they grow up and they begin to take on two cultures. Mom and dad's culture 
and yet kind of the American culture because they have to be here. But by the time they're 12, 13, 14, this is what social science and psychology says, they will develop a peer group. And that peer group will radically disciple them into whatever the mold that peer group is. And so it doesn't matter how Oaxacan they are at home. It doesn't matter how Mexican they are at home. The peer group will make them like them. Obviously, mom and dad want them to grow up with other Hispanics because mom and dad are fans of Mexico, as they should be. But the kids are coming into their own. But the peer group will always decide. And if immigration in American history is any indicator, they always choose to adapt to the greater culture which is going to be, in this case, American culture. They're going to run with Americans. They're going to run with whites and blacks and, and other Hispanics that are more Americanized because that's what they want to be. Now they become a child of two cultures. Sociology also says they will more than likely marry someone of the second culture, which means growing up, Spanish will probably not be spoken in their home. Tamales will probably only be eaten occasionally, and the grandchildren will think mo- grandparents culture is foreign and bizarre. This is how we lose kids to the world as Christians. We stop parenting and discipling them once they can wipe their rear end and fix a bowl of Cheerios. We absolutely stop taking any interest in them once they can drive. That's how this church has lost kids. That's how some of you have lost your kids. Because you thought because they were mobile and independent, you were done. And yet somebody had a peer group ready for them, drinking, smoking, fornicating, mocking church, running with progressive ideologies and, and what have you. And so they're comfortable in two cultures. Ours is the one they're going to leave. They're going to go off into the world and be a part of the cool culture, the TikTok culture, the social media culture. And though they're, they're fluent in this culture, they don't want any part of it because their peer group makes fun of this. So how do you handle someone that mocks your God and your church? You have to put them out, moron. They mock you behind your back. They mock your church behind your back. What? You're just going to like take that to the chin? Like Pastor Vaughn told me 25 years ago, you won't confront it because you're a coward. That situation, because I mentioned it this morning, there was a minister that left our church and ran Pastor Vaughn down. She absolutely eviscerated him, told everybody he was demon-possessed and that the church was a cult. And, and I knew this had happened, and I was living in Knoxville at the time. So here's a minister who makes fun of my spiritual father. Here's a minister who criticizes my father in the faith and the church that made me what I was. I'm in Knoxville. I'm a youth leader. I'm an elder in my church. Got a career that's going... And I hadn't heard from this guy in a couple years, and he somehow gets my number and says, hey, I'm passing through Knoxville on my way to minister in one of the Carolinas. I don't remember which one. Would it, could, we, could I stay with you? Could we fellowship and catch up? And I, honestly, I was excited to catch up, but in the back of my mind, I also know you hate my pastor. You criticize him, although all he's ever done for you is help you, prop you up, invest in you, sow into you. I know the story. I know what you've done to him. But I honestly, I was wanting to remember the good things, the good services I was in with him, the influence he had for the positive. So I had him over. He stayed in my apartment. I let him have my bed. I slept on the couch because he was a minister. I was a single guy. I took him out for dinner that night. We had a great time fellowshipping. I paid for dinner. Took him out for breakfast the next morning. We had a great time fellowshipping. I paid for breakfast because I was taught to honor. I was happy to do so. We went to like Cracker Barrel and IHOP. These were not expensive places. But, you know, good food and probably 30 or 40 bucks, 30, 40 dollar bill each time. This is 2002 or 2003. And then I bid him adieu. He went on his way and I guess he preached and he did text back later. We did have texting in the early 2000s. It was very rudimentary. Your thumb could do all of it with only nine (laughs) alphanumeric. You could do it behind your back. (laughs) Try that with a touch screen. You'll be cussing someone out in German. (laughs) Some of you are too young to remember. They used to have competitions. And people could do 3,000 words behind their back flawlessly. Just just blow through it. Just one thumb, alphanumeric. You'd always drop down to the zero for a space. 
You'd come over for a period. You won't know I just text and send all of you. I love you and I'm honored to pastor you. And then I just followed up with a JK. Listen, we didn't have, we didn't have shorthand in those days. We spelled all those words out because we were literate. R-O-F-L did not come out till you had touchscreen later. R-O-T-F-L, sound like Scooby-Doo getting shocked. Rawful, rawful. So fast forward a couple months. In those years, I was getting a tape. I was getting three or four tapes a week from this ministry to keep me caught up on what pastor was preaching. And I get this tape where pastor warns about fellowshipping with people that mock your church. This is three or four weeks after this guy has come to my home and moved on. And I'm driving down the road and I hear it and my bottom falls out. My, my, my faith fails me. My heart fails me. Every bit of my strength and courage is poured out because I realize I have sinned against my spiritual father. I was sick at my stomach. I said, this is nailing me. I wasn't even in the service. Service was two months prior. I'm getting the tape later. I listened to it later in a queue. It's weeks past the sermon was preached, weeks past me hosting this guy, and yet I'm under gross conviction because I have hosted a guy who has attacked my spiritual father, and I said nothing about it. I am so convicted. This is when I made, the, I made an appointment. In those days, I would make an appointment to come and meet with Pastor Vaughn, and I would drive 100 miles to come and meet with my spiritual father, most of the time just to have my rear end chewed. That was part of my discipleship. He did not spare the brick because I spent 20 bucks on gas. He gave me two bricks, dealt with me. Sometimes he just clapped my head in between them and straightened me out. So I made an appointment to come here to repent to him. I wasn't gonna do it over the phone, it felt cheap. So he said, what's going on, Chris? I said, well, I got a message. I got one of your tapes and you were, preaching and you said, you know, some of you, you're harboring fugitives from our church and you're, you're, you're fellowshipping with people that mock us. How could you do that? Don't you know you're fellowshipping with confusion and perversion and chaos? And, and, I, and he said, yes, sir. I said, I remember that message. I said, well, I just had so-and-so come stay with me a couple weeks ago. And he said, oh. And he said, did, did you know what he did to our church? I said, I, I did know. Did you know what he was saying about me? Yes, sir, I did know. So you weren't ignorant to any of it. I said, well, probably the gross details, but I knew the generality. He said, okay. Did you ask him, has he repented to me or our church? Has he made it right since he betrayed us and slandered us and ran us down all over the South? I said, I didn't ask him that. He said, did you confront him about his betrayal of your spiritual father? I said, I did not confront him on that. And he said, you know why you didn't? And this is where I said, no, but you're going to tell me because you're a coward. You're a coward, Chris. You call yourself a minister and you're a coward. You refuse to confront sin. You're a, he called me a coward. It felt like a hundred times. It was definitely a solid four or five or six. And he said, did you take him out to dinner? Yes, sir. Did you take him out to breakfast? Yes, sir. Did you pay for both of them? Yes, sir. He used you, Chris. How does it feel to be used by someone that hates your church? and your father in the faith. How, how does it feel to be used and a coward? And I'm thinking, I drove 100 miles for this. <laughs> but this is making me a man of character and ethics. And I swore in my heart in that moment, if I ever see him again, I will confront him. I don't have to be rude about it. I don't have to be tactless about it. But I will have to confront it if I'm going to pass this test. And that thing haunted me. That was 2002. I was not, I did not have the opportunity to confront him until 2008, after Pastor Vaughn was dead. The, the desire to pass that test and make it right with my God was even posthumously. Pastor Vaughn has been dead for a year and a half, maybe almost two years. It was actually at Christmas time. I was in Georgia at my Aunt Deborah's house, laying in bed. It was Christmas Eve. And this minister calls me. I've not heard from him in six years. And he calls me to wish me a happy or Merry Christmas. And my heart begins pounding in my chest because here's my opportunity to pass the test. 
and I don't even know what to say. I don't know how to say it, but I am not going to fail this again. I will not be a coward. I will not be a posthumous coward. Pastor Vaughn's dead, and he's still calling me a coward. And I'm pastoring his church at that time. So I just as best as I could, I said, hey, you know, I heard you did this to Pastor Vaughn in our church. And you slandered him and told a bunch of churches he was a demonized man and they shouldn't have him in. And you ran him down even though you were taking money from the church as an offering and a ministry. And he got real quiet. It wasn't probably the Christmas Eve greeting he was expecting. I was like the ghost of Marley. And <laughs> wish I had some chains to rattle at him. That's a Dickens reference, by the way. And he got real quiet. I said, oh, I took that as a guilty. I said, did you ever repent to Pastor Vaughn knowing he hadn't? And he lied to me. He said, oh, oh me and Kenny got it right. Me and Kenny got it right. Yeah, we got it right. Kenny, Kenny understood. Kenny understood how it was. And, and it wasn't like you said it was, but I, I can see the discrepancy. But we got it right. Kenny and I were good when he passed. And I thought, no, you're a liar. And at least I passed the character test because you obviously have none. And it wasn't too much longer after that, I got to see him minister again at a funeral. And he was stuck in 1996. He had never advanced. This was now 2010, 2011. Went to a funeral of a mutual friend. He happened to be the minister doing the funeral. And I thought, you are stuck in the mid-90s. It is 14, 15 years later, and you have not advanced. And that's what being a coward will do. It will keep you in the past. The kingdom will roll past you. You will be going through dead motions, and you won't understand what it means to be current with God because you don't have a backbone to confront sin. I have no idea how we got off on that from uh, confirmation. But I figured if we're going to read Catholicism, we ought to tell some Holy Ghost stories at the same time. Just balance the scales there. So coming back to our friends, that's how we lost kids, because they had, they had wicked friends. We stopped parenting them. We stopped discipling them, because now they're so busy. But there's no reason to have, lose your kids to sports teams. There's no, busy, there's no reason to lose kids to a part-time job. They don't even need the job. So why lose them to that? Because... If they have another peer group at 13 and 14, they're going to just abide their time in the Oaxacan home so they can step out on their own, and that'll be nothing but how they were raised. And they will miss the occasional tamale, but they will not be Oaxacan in their heart. And some of your backslidden prodigals, they might miss the occasional move of the Holy Ghost, but they are not Christian in their heart. And I'm sorry you've suffered loss. But I have to now take our church so that we don't do it again. We, we disciple our children to the very end. My friends that are successful with their kids, their kids in their 20s and 30s still come and say, Dad, how do I do this? Mom, what should I do here? They're still looking to mom and dad as the biggest voice in their life. Because they were there every step of the way. They did not let the kids start raising themselves just because they went through puberty, could wipe their ear in, drive a car and fix some Cheerios. Kids have to have a lot more than that. Amen. They need a mom and dad in their life until they get married. And even then, if you do it right, they'll say, Mom, what do I do? Dad, how do you do this? My, my friend, Pastor Ed Weiss, died. And I asked his sons, what do you miss the most? And they said, I miss being able to ask my dad anything. I, I miss, one, of, one of the sons said, I just miss doing stuff with them which let me know Pastor Ed spent time with his kids. They did stuff together, and he was constantly teaching them. He said, my dad was easier than Google. He knew everything. <laughs> that meant they had to walk with their dad every day of their life. Dad was ever-present. So we have to do better. Age of discretion. So let me read some of this stuff here out of the, out of the uh, catechism. Confirmation is called the sacrament of Christian maturity because it's when the young believer at 12, 13, 14 says, all right, this God of mom and dad, this church of mom and dad, I want it to be my own. And some of our kids have just abode, and they've abided their time here so they could just get out of Dodge. And that, let, that lets me know something's broken at home. Dad's not present. Mom's not present. They're busy chasing money. Church is what we do on Sundays. And pastor, well, you know, he was preaching at us, but you know what? Forget him. 
So we teach our kids how to rebel against spiritual authority, even though Hebrew says, submit to those that have the rule over you. So you'll trouble your own house. You'll inherit nothing. Catechism, excuse me, confirmation is, is when the, the, the 12 and 13 year old says, I'm ready to make this God my own. And that's what my friend David said. He said, catechism is where you say, I'm ready to walk with God for my own. Confirmation, excuse me. Confirmation is when you say, I'm ready to do this on my own. I want to be a Christian. In their case, I want to be a Catholic. This is my faith. I want to own it. I want to be a part of what God is doing. And we maybe should start to look at how we can make that work in our circles rather than just, you know, da 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 you now move from middle school to high school. What can we do to implement that in our kids to make sure that this church now becomes their church? That they take ownership in the helps department. They take ownership in evangelism. They take ownership in the guest minister coming. That they want to be a part of that. That engrafted word church isn't just the church I was born into. It's the church I'm going to get married in. I'm not going to Vegas for some yoga Elvis juggling nut. This is where I want to get married. So let me read this from the catechism. It says, preparation for confirmation should aim at leading the Christian toward a more intimate union with Christ and a more lively familiarity with the Holy Spirit, his actions, his gifts, and his biddings. In order to be more capable of assuming the apostolic responsibility of Christian life. What? That's Catholic doctrine? Confirmation is all about taking a 12 year old. 12. And aim at leading them. Who's going to do it? Should be mom and dad. Though the Catholic Church does have what they call sponsors that help lead people through confirmation should aim at leading the Christian toward a more intimate union with Christ and a more lively familiarity with the Holy Spirit, his actions, his gift, and his biddings in order to be more capable of assuming the apostolic responsibilities of Christian life. Charismatics only said one, people, one group of people could be apostles, and that was the apostles. The Catholics say we all have an apostolic responsibility to go. I like that a lot better than our flavor. To this end, catechesis, that is the process of being taught, for confirmation should strive to awaken a sense of belonging to the church of Jesus Christ, the universal church, as well as the parish community. The latter, that means the parish community, bears special responsibility for the preparation of the confirmands, that is those being confirmed. So what's that mean? When we walk somebody through confirmation or when the Catholics do, they're teaching them, you take ownership in our church. You take ownership in the parish, that is the region of Catholicism in our area. They're teaching the young people, you have a part to play. This is your church. This is your faith. This isn't get out of the way, you kids, you know, just get out of my face. I got worship practice. Get out of my face. We got VBS lessons. No, come pick up something, pick up a mop, pick up a broom. Let's work for the Lord. We're going door to door with this. This is how we live. This is what we do. This is how we live. It isn't, you can't wait to get the heck out of Dodge and have a tamale occasionally. This is, I want to go home. I want Oaxaca in my own house. Let me find this last point here. These points bounce all over the place. 1303. I just read 1309. Where did we jump to? Where's 1303? Well, I must have lost it somewhere. 1313. All right. I'll just read this final thing here. The administration of this sacrament by the bishops of the church demonstrates clearly that its effect is to unite those who receive confirmation more closely to the church, to her apostolic origins, and to her mission of bearing witness to Jesus Christ. The purpose of this sacrament in totality is to unite those who receive it more closely to the church, 
to the church's apostolic origins, that means to go, and to the church's mission of bearing witness to Jesus Christ. Now, this is all the intents of Catholicism and Catholic catechism. It doesn't mean everybody who participates gets the heart of it. I've been to Iceland several times. Their national church is Lutheran. They go through confirmation, and confirmation does nothing for them. Confirmation is a total social thing for them. I've been told that confirmation in Iceland is like a combination of high school graduation, birthday, Christmas, and Easter, and they get lots of gifts. So everybody's eager to do it, but nobody gets what's happening. So though this is laid out in the Catholic catechism, I'm not saying that everybody who's a Catholic understands what we've just read. We have ears to hear. We can hear what they were aiming for whenever this was originally codified, but we ought to at least apply it. Understand that at some point, our children and honestly, we would call this a rededication sacrament where your heart says, I want to make this gospel my gospel. I want to be united to my church closer. I want to be united to the apostolic mission of the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to not just sit and take notes, but to go and preach the gospel. I want to more closely understand what it means to be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of confirmation. It's one of the harder ones and we can't quite see it, but we also see how we can lay hands on people in a prayer of rededication. And I'm going to pray about what we could do for our young people because I don't want to make it a legalistic thing. And if we have some that do and some that don't, now we have a A team and B team, but it may be something we practice on our own in our homes with our children. To that end, we've kind of done it. We've told our children we have until 13 to disciple you with the foundation. After that, what happens, mommy? What happens, daddy? We just beat you harder. It's a joke, but after that, we have to change how we train you. After that, we have to hold your hand and watch over you a little bit differently. After that, we have to be mindful who you hang out with. We've lost kids in this church in my 17 years because of who their secondary culture was. We're still feeling the effects of it. But the adage is true. Show me your friends, I show you your destiny. You show me your friends, I'll show you your destiny. You show me who you run with, I'll show you what you're going to end up like. You run with folks that mock the Holy Ghost, you're going to deny the Trinity. You mock with folks that mock, uh, run with folks that mock Pentecost, you're going to dry up tongues. That's, that's blasphemous. To deny the Trinity, to deny Pentecostal experiences when you've been exposed to it, that's blasphemous. That's regression. But you don't learn that on your own. That's a who. Who did bewitch you? To, to mock the church God called you to, who you run with, what familiar spirit. Everybody ought to think their church is the best church in the city because it's the one they're called to. And I guarantee you this, I brag on you more than some of you brag on me. I guarantee it, I brag on you everywhere I go. I tell them that church pulls for me, they do anything I need them to do, They're, they support everything we do. And yet, some of you, you're like, well, I mean, uh, I guess you could come to church if you wanted. I don't know if I recommend it. He may step on your toes. He may fix you. <laughs> well, probably not. He's been working on me for 17 years, and he's not successful. <laughs> the secret is still toe boots. Secret is a calloused heart. Secret is a lot of bedroom gossip and slander. Come to think of it, come on. I'll teach you how to dodge any sermon he preaches. And you can go to hell like I am, deceived in my own mind. Every Christian ought to think their church is the best church because it's the one God has called them to. And no church is a perfect church because there's people there. And there's lazy people there. And there's zealous people there. And there's broken people there. But if you're called someplace, you ought to be proud to be called there. Now all you have to stop and do is think, what have I been given? What have I been taught? How, how much success in my life is due to where God has called me to go to church? Instead of letting somebody talk you out of who God's placed in your life. I, honestly, I've had to tell even family members, you talk bad about my church or my pastor one more time and I'm done with you. I will cut you off and I won't think twice. I'll see you in heaven. I don't have time for that junk. Quit insulting my worship team. Turn it off if you don't like it. I don't, it's not, 
Why, why worship a carnal pig? Why try to please folks who are backslidden and lukewarm? They can't save you, nor do they know how. They can't even save themselves. Don't run with deluded people. You'll end up deluded yourself. Run with folks who are doing something for God. Clean like. Amen. Well, that completes the sacraments. That one I put off the longest because I was like, I don't know how I'm going to bend that like Beckham into our reign, but I think I did a pretty good job. The Holy Spirit certainly helped me. I'm going to, I am, like I said, I'm working on converting all this into a pod school so we can see some things and hopefully help us in our home life, help us in our rituals and even Pentecostalism because we do lay hands on folk. We have marriage ceremonies. We have communion. If we can understand that it's a ritual, we will treat it more respectfully. We can get God's endorsement on it more. And we'll honor God. And when we honor God, he shows up. And I want him to show up. I want him to show up because we need his presence. All right.